My name is John McMahon. I'm a retired Master Sergeant of Infantry of the Army with 26 years of service. I have a background in security, military intelligence, aerospace, information technology, and nuclear and chemical weapons. After attending the Army's Nuclear Chemical Biological Accident and Incident Control course, I served as acting commander of headquarters Fort Huachuca at a time when we conducted a national exercise uh, to test our ability to react to emergency response to a nuclear or a chemical accident. In this case, the accident, I believe, was chemical. As a concerned Idahoan, I do not accept the modification to the 1995 settlement agreement that allows commercial spent nuclear fuel to come into Idaho. And here are a few important reasons why. Nuclear waste can be stored safely at the point of origin. And one of the reasons that is is because those places are already all hardened up and so it's logical that, they, that the storage should take place there unless, as in the case of Fukushima, we don't want to store any more stuff at that location. Idaho is widely recognized as a non-consent state, and since the 70s, it has been, in fact, a very hot topic around here about whether we should store nuclear waste from other places. The 1995 settlement agreement clearly expressed Idaho's refusal to consent to the importation of commercial radioactive waste. The Lyme Commission must not renegotiate the settlement agreement for any purposes. The most important mission at the Idaho National Lab is to protect Idaho land, water, people through the cleanup of existing nuclear waste, and some of it was generated at the reactors that existed or still exist at the uh, lab today. Anyway, on a personal note, I really support America's national laboratories because I have family members that have worked in them, and there's a lot of very critical research going on in those places that not only benefits the United States, but it benefits a lot of people in the world, and, and it's a good return on investment for American taxpayers. So these, these national labs are very important, and the research mission, with a few exceptions of things that were mentioned here, which I can't go into right now, uh, they should continue. So I certainly support that. Uh, in fact, my family has sponsored people from France, Poland, China, Japan, and Greece, they've lived in our home. And uh, so this is an indication, by the way, I believe, that the United States is willing to share in efforts that benefit everyone on the planet. So science, yes, more nuclear waste from other places, commercial nuclear waste, no. Uh, we're already taking in the Navy stuff and we have to live up to that part of the agreement, I'm sure. Well, thank you very much. Do you have any questions of me? We appreciate your comments, and thanks for bringing this document. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Next on the list, Mr. Ed Keener. Members of the Commission, my name is Ed Keener. I reside at 3423 North 39th in Boise. I come before you um, as opposed to additional outside uh, nuclear materials being stored in Idaho, brought to Idaho. Uh, we don't need that. I come also as um, a family member who um, my cousin and I grew up in North Boise, uh, one mile from each other. We are downwinders, our families are. We raised our, uh, milked our own cows, drank the milk, our own vegetables, um, had large gardens. My cousin died three years ago of a very virulent form of cancer, 
um, and it was because of nuclear contamination. Not only was he a downwinder, but he worked on the ICBM missiles and was, was assured that there was no, would be no problem. I also have cancer. Um, if you have family members that have, that have cancer from radiation, you know that it's, it's a, a terrible thing. And uh, my philosophy about uh, nuclear storage in, in large quantities is it's safe until it isn't. There will be a spill. There will be contamination. Um, we can um, hope and tell ourselves that, that the technology will take care of the problem, but it won't. Nuclear energy, nuclear contamination um, is, is a, a bad way to die. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Eric Brent. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Brandt. Uh, I'm a member of the Snake River Alliance, and I presently live in Meridian. I want to thank you, Chairman Sayer, and members of the Lion Commission for allowing me uh, to testify here. I've been a healthcare professional for over 30 years, doing what I can to relieve suffering in all its forms within the range of my abilities. I've mainly worked as a massage therapist and instructor, and I've also more recently moved into helping people as a health advisor. I primarily assist people in rebuilding their health by educating them to remove factors from their life that are creating poor health, of which there are many to deal with these days, such as electromagnetic pollution and other environmental toxins in all their forms. I'm here today to comment on the issue about that's being considered by the Lyon Commission concerning whether Idaho ought to open its doors to taking in commercial radioactive waste. I'm strongly opposed to Idaho taking in more nuclear waste and I won't accept a modification to the 1995 settlement agreement that allows commercial spent fuel to come into Idaho. Idaho is a non-consent state in this regards, and in my humble opinion, it's an intelligent choice for it to remain a non-consent state. The people of Idaho have voted no, and that means no for very valid reasons. The reasons for my strong opposition are many, but I will focus on sharing a few of these. From my perspective, what I feel and think is at stake here is the entirely possible endangerment of every living being, be they human, animal, bird, insect, microbe, and all others that are affected by radiation. It's my understanding that the Snake River Alliance began its duties out of the awareness that the nuclear waste at INL was being disposed of in a less than safe manner by dumping it into open, unlined pits and injecting it straight into the aquifer. Uh, this wasn't a very smart move on my, uh, in my mind. Um, so I think that's a huge health risk to all of southern Idaho. Not only do we now have this previous damage done to be concerned about, but we have thousands of metric tons of nuclear waste sitting there waiting for something to happen. The fact that INL was built in a very geologically unstable area between Yellowstone and Craters of the Moon is my main concern. I'm not a geologist, but I have a keen interest in the geological movements that are increasingly happening worldwide. I've seen scientifically researched graphs and tables which show that this increase is in fact happening. Whether our Earth will continue to shimmy and shake more or run out of steam is another unknowable question, but it does seem to be the nature of this planet to be ever-changing and dramatically so at times. From my research on Yellowstone Caldera, it doesn't qualify as a dried up, dead forever volcano. It still has huge potential to go from its present scenic, babbling mud pots and pools all the way to a raging supervolcano whenever it is stimulated to do so. INL sits very close to this, for now, sleeping dragon. In relation to what I just said, I think it's very important for everyone to contemplate for whatever amount of time it takes what life would be like if INL does experience a large enough geological movement to shatter containment vessels and or destroy the electrical systems that safeguard the lab, the lab, thereby releasing radiation. This could create a living hell for all who are in the area, and that area could expand to include the whole northern hemisphere and eventually the whole planet, as wind and water tend to carry elements great distances. 
It doesn't seem rational or intelligent to me that INL would have been built there in the first place, let alone to be a site for storing nuclear waste or for adding more waste fuel to this potential bomb fire. My personal experience in regards to how fast life can change in geology in particular happened on March 11th of 2011 when I was in Honolulu. It was just another beautiful peaceful evening in paradise when suddenly the sirens went off all over the island. We found out that we had about four or five hours to get ready for the tsunami that was on its way. No one knew how big it would be or where it would be safe to be when it came in. Everyone started scrambling to get food, water, and basic survival gear stored up. It was true, truly one of life's wake-up moments for me. I realized how at any moment life can change and that I wasn't very ready for what was coming and that life could soon get very challenging. Fortunately, as fate would have it, Oahu and most of the islands didn't suffer too much damage from the tsunami. The Japanese who were, are, and will be affected for many years by the phenomena there are the ones who, are really, who have really learned the dangers of living on an uncontrollable earthquake fault lines while using technologies that, can be, that can't be safely contained, disposed of, or reverse engineered to be non-hazardous. You members of this commission and the nuclear industry in its entirety seem to be quite willing to gamble on the possibility that no significantly destructive geological movements, natural or man-made, will damage the many nuclear facilities in the U.S. or world, even though the Fukushima catastrophe happened a short time ago. We might not have another Fukushima within our lifetimes, and maybe we won't for hundreds or thousands of years. I pray not, but the Fukushima event isn't over yet, and there's much evidence that the fallout from it has drifted around the world and will continue to do so, affecting all in its pathway. To sum up here, I think that the existing nuclear waste ought to be stored as safely as possible and as close as possible to its point of generation. It's not necessary to bring commercial radioactive waste into Idaho for storage or research. We have way more than enough here already. I think that technologies of any kind that are being created ought not to be put into use until they can be safely contained, controlled, and disposed of, or re-engineered back to a non-hazardous state, to a very large degree, depending on how dangerous they potentially are. At this point in time, I feel that the most important mission at INL is to protect Idaho's land, water, people, and all its inhabitants by putting their time, energy, and money into focusing on cleaning up all the existing radioactive contamination above the Snake River Aquifer. I'd like to thank the Chairman and the members of the Line Commission for listening to and reflecting upon my perspective. Mr. Brent, thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> Those are some very articulate points. Is there any chance we could get a copy of that document? Sure. And put that in the record? Sure. Okay, we appreciate you coming today, and thanks for those thoughts. Thank you. Okay, um, next on the list is David, and I apologize if I get this wrong, Monsees? Well, how, how do you say it? Monses. Monses. I stand corrected. P welcome. Thank you. I'm Dr. David Monses uh, from Eagle, Idaho. Uh, I'm a private citizen with uh, serious public health concerns regarding any attempt to ease restriction on the 1995 settlement. Uh, Idaho has repeatedly uh, rejected radioactive waste in, in Idaho, and I'm not concerned so much about uh, many of the things you're, you're dealing with concerning uh, you know, good research and development opportunities that Idaho should take advantage of. Uh, what does concern me is storing a great, great quantity of waste on top of the largest aquifer west of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, I think that was a mistake in the first place. It happens. It's there. Uh, the uh, you know, statement was made earlier today suggesting that, you know, with, with oversight and, and uh, all that uh, risk will be minimized, but risk still exists. No one denied that. And uh, what uh, I, I see and, and some others I've talked to have seen is that among the tasks of your job is the political one of taking the heat uh, for Governor Otter uh, as he moves to reduce restrictions. Uh, that's a, a concern and a fear. Uh, uh, and I truly envy your task if that is part of what your task is. Uh, you cannot know uh, 
when or how uh, an accident will happen. Uh, I see the, the major potential problem being seismic or uh, seismic that's perhaps been induced by uh, increased fracking uh, in the state that has been shown to increase earthquakes. And uh, there, you, you can't count on either state or federal government to really control that. Uh, I, I see, uh, I worked in Washington, D.C. for over 25 years, and uh, it seems that the Congress we have uh, now uh, on both sides of the aisle uh, show a moral, moral weakness and short-term greed in terms of dealing with very, very serious problems. Uh, they seem to be unable to uh, come to any conclusions. Uh, the uh, agreement uh, that uh, occurred in 1995 uh, has been breached uh, not, not unlike uh, the, uh, the treaties with the American Indians. Uh, it, was, it was agreed that uh, this was to be you know, interim storage uh, and still more material are coming in and still interim, uh, I've been told uh, from a couple of sources, uh, is not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, it looks like interim's becoming forever. Uh, and uh, while Idaho will be paid uh, by the federal government, uh, the, the issue is that the risk will still exist here in Idaho for the people of Idaho. Um, I investigated waste, fraud, and abuse for the feds for a couple of years, and Frankly, if you expect uh, oversight and enforcement to minimize risk, uh, I think, unfortunately, you're sadly mistaken. Uh, in the long-term uh, oversight of operations in facilities, we've seen again and again accidents uh, in whatever sector of the economy uh, that are a result of uh, problems being located and never dealt with. Uh, the fact of the matter is the Congress and uh, the executive branch uh, with the political appointees at the top are not interested in upsetting their constituencies locally and all it takes from my personal experience has been a call from a congressman's office, not even necessarily the congressman, to get a problem shoved under the table and ignored. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're dealing with what I consider to be really serious risk that you can't count on anybody else uh, to uh, minimize. Our, um, and, and when uh, the seismic problems fracture the containment, uh, which is the basalt cap over the aquifer, uh, then this is going to be a problem that's not just going to be local to the eastern Idaho desert. It's going to be a problem that uh, empties into the snake, and it will end up being a serious health hazard for the northwestern United States. Um, this, this will be uh, tantamount, really, to another Fukushima. It'll, it'll certainly uh, overshadow all of the Mideastern wars we've been engaged in because it's going to last for generations. And it may not be that this accident, as the prior speaker said, will occur you know, anytime soon. It could be a thousand years from now. But it will happen from uh, you know, historical experience. And if it doesn't affect you, doesn't affect Governor Otter, it's going to affect your heirs and the heirs of your heirs. And you cannot assume that the people of Idaho will forget. Uh, the elephant in the room today also has been the fact the courts have just blocked any newer renewal licenses for nuclear power plants because the NRC still 
has not sufficiently dealt with nuclear waste. And uh, so I ask you to please follow their lead. Uh, the INL can conduct valuable research without altering the current settlement, and the state of Idaho should do everything in their power to try and get that waste off of the aquifer. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Okay, our last uh, is Beatrice. Oh, we have two more? Okay. Oh. I don't, we don't have that sheet. Okay, I'll tell you what, the next one we have on our list is Beatrice. Is she here? Beatrice, why don't you come forward and then let's, we'll fill the time as best we can. Thank you. Uh, my name is Beatrice Brails Ford. Um, I have been with the Snake River Alliance in eastern Idaho since 1987, and I am very happy to be here today. Uh, most of my work uh, with the Alliance is on cleanup of the very substantial contamination that the activities at the Idaho National Laboratory have caused in eastern Idaho. Uh, those activities have damaged our, our land and our water substantially. Uh, over the years, having focused on the cleanup program, I can also say that the cleanup program has made substantial progress in addressing some of those problems, uh, mitigating those problems. Some of the contamination has been contained, but uh, like all pollution, uh, particularly I think radioactive pollution, um, our land and water will be contaminated until the end of time by some of the past activities. Uh, I'm going to just make some pretty informal comments, and I know you understand that um, Liz Woodruff addressed you last time on behalf of the Alliance. So I just, these are more sort of responses to some of the things I'm hearing, and um, I will, you know, as this process goes forward, the Alliance will continue to be engaged. I do appreciate what Mr. Sayers said this morning about. Um, this isn't about the settlement agreement. This is about going forward and the opportunities that uh, may be on the horizon. But I will also note that um, the presenters this morning from industry were focused quite sharply on um, nuclear waste as a, an opportunity. And even uh, Mr. Lyons on Tuesday, I think his phrase was INL's budget and mission growth depend on consolidated storage of nuclear waste. So yes, I, I, I appreciate what you said this morning. I think that as long as there is a seemingly inexorable connection between the future of nuclear power and nuclear waste, which I think we'll, we all agree with, uh, we have to keep talking about it. I'm sorry. Um, so you have heard uh, several times today, I know you have heard before, that um, Idaho is a non-consent state. Um, I was one of the people who was very active in the Stop the Shipments movement, and I could give you a lot of reasons why specifically Idaho people uh, felt strongly about that. Uh, a lot of that was because um, of all the promises all those years that were not kept. Uh, the alliance itself, uh, is also opposed to consolidating nuclear waste storage in no small measure because it moves a burden to solve a political problem rather than an environmental problem. And, uh, you know, you have to really weigh how much effort this country and a particular small group of people has to put forward to solve somebody else's political problem. Um, I have heard in eastern Idaho um, that there is, that, that it's time to get rid of the 1995 settlement agreement. It's old, it's out of date, it's 17 years old for heaven's sakes. Uh, the half-life of plutonium, uh, plutonium remains hazardous for about a quarter of a million years. So, so 17 years, that's the reason Idaho signed the agreement was because promises weren't kept 
and the risk is a very long-lived risk. So saying every 10, 15, 20 years, or tomorrow afternoon, we have to come up with a new agreement to address fundamental problems, I think is short-sighted in itself. Finally, um, I do want to say a little bit about this process, and, and I respect what you're doing. And I respect that it was almost, I, well, I understand now, that it was almost inevitable that the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future would um, appear to present opportunities for nuclear activities. I want to note that the Blue, the Blue Ribbon Commission had, what, at the end of the day, eight key recommendations. And I, what I've noticed is everyone supports all of those recommendations. And so, so everybody says BRC, 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 reprocessing, BRC. The Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future did not recommend going forward on reprocessing. So I think everybody is looking at the Blue Ribbon Commission report and seeing what we want to see. So all of a sudden, here in a country that is evident that I had thought was founded on some sort of consent process, suddenly consent-based is the shiniest, newest object in the nuclear waste debate. And we have leapt directly to that. And I think, frankly, some of the modifications between the draft, well, I, so we've left leapt directly to this, we are going to go into this consent-based process. But the Blue Ribbon Commission, um, to, 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 you know, it's, it's sort of um, shorthand recommendations on citing any nuclear waste facility. First, and we keep forgetting this, particularly if we work for the DOE, I think, get a new organization in charge. So, so Department of Energy, you know, my colleagues met with the Department of Energy earlier this year, and DOE is saying it wants to make, quote, it wants to show progress by the end of the year. And A, is it DOE? You know, if DOE is going to be replaced with a nuclear waste management organization, DOE should stop trying to look like it's making progress on nuclear waste management. If this country thinks that that recommendation was an appropriate one, then we have to stop and organize that administration. So once that, and then the Blue Ribbon Commission went on, once the new organization is in place, then again, this is something that my colleagues have uh, been pressing the DOE to remember way before you start cruising around the country trying to find out who loves radioactivity most. What are the criteria for such a facility? You know, just initially so that you can decide who not to entertain. Uh, you know, not the firm all the way down to is it a million or a million and one, but this, so far, we have seen nothing from anyone, and we're evidently having meetings somewhere, and I, I, I'm, I understand that I have to stop. We're, we're evidently having meetings. This morning, the Ariva, gentleman from Ariva was talking about eight states, six of, whom, six of which already have DOE sites. And, you know, consent-based, there is an element in consent that requires transparency because you have got to know who's saying yes. And you've got to also know at the end of the day, Idaho has said no. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I, I am going to leave with you. Uh, I know the Blue Ribbon Commission folks saw this numerous times. Uh, the principles for safeguarding nuclear waste at reactors uh, it is dated March 24th, 2010, and is signed by public interest groups in all 50 states. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Now we are running short on time, and I apologize for missing the, the earlier three registrants. Let's, let's move forward quickly. Um, Lisa? Or who? Okay, I have, I have Michael Jones, Suzanne Lewis, and Lisa Young. I'm not, I'm, Lisa is not testifying, no. Oh, okay. Okay. So Michael, Suzanne, and Julie? All right, let's move forward, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Jones. Um, I uh, have a few comments, and I, I apologize, they're not organized really well, but I have some notes. And, you know, I, I, I appreciate your work here, and I appreciate the sort of um, congenial atmosphere here. I've been in uh, hearings in the farther back in the 80s when it wasn't so congenial from one side of the, of the, of the table to the other, and I'm really glad that it is. But I, I, my main purpose in coming here is I don't have technical information on nukes. I used to, but I don't anymore. But I do have some basic principles that I want to share with you, and I want to share them because I think to some extent a commission like you folks, I don't know you folks, I, I'm sure you're wonderful people and you're doing a good job. But I think to some extent you're possibly working in a narrow focus situation. I, the, bubble, the word bubble came to mind, but that didn't sound nice. You're focused, you have a narrow mission, but I, outside the focus of generating jobs or, nu or whatever it is in the nuclear industry, there's a much bigger world out there. And most of us don't have technical expertise and we don't know what is exactly going on unless we make our livings that way. And these are the people that you hear who welcome this sort of activity in our state. I just want to do a quick historical thing. INEL was located here because they wanted to flush nuclear and chemical waste into the aquifer. That's one of the main reasons they located here in the first place, because it was out west and there were ja only jackrabbits and, and sagebrush out here and a few people who have become willing participants through the influx of money and so forth. They only stopped the injection wells when public awareness of that practice became known in the early 80s. General awareness became known and Governor Evans at the time made moves in the day and they agreed to stop this flushing into the aquifer. There's, okay. The second thing is, is that uh, it was, previous reference was made to the geological instability of that area. As you know, three rivers disappear on the site. This means like major underground water happening there, not just seeping. And the other thing is the, the earthquake thing. The INEL site was in the most sensitive earthquake zone listed by the U.S. Geological Survey until public awareness of the nuclear site and, and the threats to the aquifer began to be known and they rewrote the, the uh, USGS uh, um, criteria for earthquake zone and, and took it down one notch to only moderately dangerous for earthquakes. It's, a, it's an unholy alliance to some extent between industry and government to keep something going, to keep a gravy train going, so to speak. I don't, I'm sorry, that's a little bit rude. To keep like a, flur, a, a, a wonderful flood of money and resources going in a certain direction. And I just want you to know that there are a lot of us out here who urge you to take a longer view People talk about making decisions for seven generations. This is the reverse of people who want a few more jobs in Idaho Falls next year or tomorrow or sometime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Suzanne Lewis. I'm a fifth generation Idahoan. I am a downwinder. My family comes from southeast Idaho. I am a survivor of a growth in my brain. I am a long-term advocate for respect for this sweet land and its people. 
one of the crimes, because I've spoken many times, is that starting with the factor of downwinders, we only found out the mappings of when the energy department decided to do above ground testing six years ago, where the nuclear debris went. I've testified to see if we can't have recognition by the United States Department of Energy. And we in Idaho have never been recognized. We are invisible. Utah, other people have some downwinder programs. I'm here to say today, downwinders is an epidemic in Idaho. The amount of endocrine system, diabetes, cancer, it's epidemic. And there are thousands of us affected. But the government has made us invisible. I want to go fast forward. My son <clears throat> graduated from University of Idaho in the early 2000s. He's a mechanical engineer. He's brilliant. Immediately Bechtel picked him up for over almost 10 years now. He has been on the leading edge to help with nuclear waste safety for the people, for the lands, for the waters. He has been internationally researching, trying to uphold the agreement that by 2014 we will take care of the nuclear waste that's already here. Uh, I wanted my son to become a whistleblower. Arriva was his last employer. Hear me. He has been the leading edge science to resolve nuclear waste. And he quit. He walked away. He won't be a whistleblower, but it's not working. In Idaho, we have repeatedly been denigrated, made invisible. You want more short-term money, but nuclear waste should not be moved. The promises at INEEL, and I am from that corner of the state, was that we were temporary. The waste was going to be moved to Yucca Mountain. Well, guess what, folks? The people, the Navajos, heard that their mother was going to be destroyed. Well, right now, I-N-E-E-L is over the heart of the Earth's, the Earth's heart, the major aquifer. Don't be dumb. Represent us. You say your leadership in Nuclear Energy Commission. Let's do something that's called truth-telling. Let's embrace educating and giving health rights to downwinders who are suffering right now. Let's love our state and no nuclear movement anywhere. Suzanne Lewis. Thank you, Suzanne. Julie, please. I'd like to thank you very much in this short time to still allow me to speak. Um, I'm Julie Hofnagels, longtime Idaho resident from Boise. Um, here to test today, testify today because I feel like the direction nu nuclear power will be taking in Idaho and elsewhere is going to be a defining question or the defining question facing our generation. Um, I feel I've got a speech here which I'm not going to give in full. It takes about eight minutes. I don't think you have that much time. I'll, I have copies I'll give you, which I hope you'll read. Um, to try to summarize, nuclear waste, nuclear accidents, nuclear power plants are always somewhere else, but they always end up where you are. Um, I was in Northern California in the late, in the 80s, mid-80s. Um, Chernobyl went off. I was very concerned about it, and 
A year later, I ended up in Germany and Belgium, where I lived for some time. And then I had to worry about whether my dairy products and my vegetables were still contaminated by that waste. It, it, was across the, it was the other side of the world, but it ended up being on my plate. Um, we're half a world away from Fukushima, but nuclear fallout from that accident was in Boise, Idaho in a big way. It was in the, it was in the Statesman. Um, closer to home, we have our own nuclear industry. We have research and development going on and we have nuclear storage. I'm not sure, um, we've heard a lot of people say how it came to be here. I'm not sure, given the geological situation there, we know it's different now than what it looked like then. Um, and I'm just butchering this, I apologize. Um, the one thing I would like to say is that I've been worried about nuclear accidents, ones that I imagine could happen, ones that have happened. But over the past year, what's become most important to me is the idea that <clears throat> there isn't really a safe way to dispose of nuclear garbage. Um, we look back at Europeans in the Middle Ages throwing garbage out the windows and we're horrified at that. We look back at the 1950s, people throwing garbage out of their car windows as they drive along the interstate. You know, people didn't think anything about it then. People are going to look back 500 years net from now and look at what we did with our nuclear waste and they're going to be a million times more appalled than, than that because of the long-term effect of what you've heard other people say that it could be. Um, there's one country in the world that seems to be dealing with that right now, that's Finland. They are building a deep geological repository for nuclear waste. It's in bedrock. It has consent of the people around it. And they're dealing with problems that we, mainly, that we don't even think about now, about if our society goes down the path of Rome or Egypt and we're not here to safeguard it and it's just not a working thing a thousand years from now, 500 years from now, who's going to understand the warning signs that are placed with the little nuclear triangles and stuff? Who, are people going to understand those? Is the language going to be understand? I mean, try to, try to read and understand Shakespeare or Chaucer. And are people going to understand if, if, if there is an accident, everything's blown away, are they going to be able to read those signs to even help themselves? Are they going to end up in the middle of it thinking it's something interesting? All this background, which I've put forward in a nervous way instead of a, a calm way, make me a supporter of the 1995 settlement agreement as well. I think if we start chipping away at it and let more waste into Idaho than that one was agreed upon, in other words, not letting commercial waste into Idaho, there's not going to be an end to it. There's going to be politicians back east who say, or even people here who think economic viability is the main thing, but it's our drinking water here in Boise, Idaho that I'm worried about, and maybe that's just selfish, I don't know. Um, Idahoans for the last four decades have wanted to take a long view, not a short-term view. They've wanted to think about future generations of Idahoans and what decisions we're taking now will mean. Um, I think we still need to, to take that long view. I mean, and I, when I say long, I mean 500 years from now, 1,000 years from now, not 20 years from now or 40. And I can see no reason for the settlement agreement to be changed in any way. I think that that line still needs to be drawn in the desert sands of Arco. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> if you'd like, we welcome to have your speech in record so we get the full eight minutes worth. Thank you.